Good afternoon. I hope you are all hearing me properly and um, welcoming all the panelists as well as the audience who are not, do not have the, are not lucky enough to be at the COP27 because what's going on here is really uh, quite amazing in terms of thrill, in terms of vibrancy and in terms of optimism. And I believe that all of us really do need that. Uh, during this side event, we are going to discuss a program for which uh, 35 different research and uh, uh, civil society organizations from Europe and Africa worked during four years to come and present you with the, uh, can we keep the prior slide please? Yes, to present you with the results uh, of those four years of work. Uh, the, the project we are talking about today is about setting up an international research consortium, as you can see, uh, by the, in, which purpose is uh, today to advance climate smart agriculture through Africa, Europe. But in fact, this program is the brainchild of a long cooperation between the African Union and the European Union within the FNSSA, the Food, Nutrition, Security and Sustainable Agriculture Roadmap, which has been enacted since 2016 as being the basis for which, uh, on which, sorry, uh, both uh, European and African, African and European uh, entities, agencies, uh, involved in FNSSA could work and would work better. So the uh, purpose of the uh, African Europe International Research Consortium is to address the key issues which we have found during those four years of work and which highlighted in particular uh, two important aspects. One is the necessity to bring together within a perennial structure uh, all the parties, all the multi-stakeholders, meaning the researchers and the funders, of course, but as well and as much private sector, farmers' organizations, civil society, and the funders, with the purpose of uh, designing together projects which correspond to the realities and challenges of FNSSA today. And of course, with what's going on in the world with the uh, agenda of uh, the COP27 uh, required to focus in particular on climate smart agriculture. So uh, the first uh, important uh, aspect uh, of those four years of work have resulted in is the importance of addressing the fragmentation of actors, initiatives, strategies, and programs in order to enable the different actors to see each other and uh, to know of each other, to pull together knowledge, and to be able to develop joint projects which uh, are properly studied with the help of the researchers but also properly implemented in a sustainable manner with the involvement of the different private sector practitioners. So the, the second uh, target, important target as well, identified to achieve is to uh, define the optimum governance for not just a multi-stakeholder structure, but also a bicontinental structure, which would mean Africa and Europe, Europe and Africa, not just for one project, but as an ongoing engagement uh, for uh, the benefits of everybody and for bringing to life the uh, models, the different models of CSA implemented in different countries in Africa and in Europe and make them mainstream activities. So we have, next slide, Pete. Next slide, please. 
we have um, a panel of brilliant uh, experts, uh, and we try to cover all the different um, angles of uh, what an IRC platform should achieve. And uh, I will be presenting in details uh, each of them, but I would like to start by Dr. Yemi. Oops. Dr. Yemi is presently the chairman of the, sorry, the executive director of uh, FARA. FARA is the uh, major agricultural research uh, agency uh, of Africa. And uh, Dr. Yemi, prior to being the head of, of FARA, has been uh, the head of agriculture and food security division at the African Union Commission headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia is known to be a thought and process leader in, on the continent and to be an agriculture research and development specialist with considerable expertise in natural resource management, including crop livestock integrated systems, market oriented production systems and regional value chains. He brings to the table 30 years in the practice of agriculture and rural development with increasing responsibilities including as a diplomat head of mission. Uh, outside, outside of, of work, uh, Dr. Yemi has been involved with his local community in various leadership, stewardship and incubation projects. And in particular, is teaching integrity and leadership skills to young aspiring leaders. Doc, and of, of course, Dr. Akin, I'm, I'm always, getting uh, mixed up with your name, Dr. Yemi, I'm so sorry. He's a former university lecturer and obtained his PhD in agriculture and environmental sciences from Wageningen Agricultural University in the Netherlands. And he also enjoys playing guitar and the piano. Dr. Yemi, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Dora. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here today, and just to make a few remarks um, as we get along. Um, to start off, it's been 10 years since Durban and five years since Marrakesh. A lot has happened in the African space in terms of our response, collective response to climate change in agriculture. But it is important where we are today. Uh, as you all know, we are speaking from Sham El Sheikh. And this is one event that is being put together to strengthen our collective efforts to build resilience and to ensure that the continent is the better off in terms of warding off the nuances of climate change and to keep the continent food and nutrition secure. That said, as what uh, taking a cue from what uh, Dora has uh, just explained to us about the International Research Consortium, um, what we ought to, to take out of COP27 is to understand the fact that this event showcases a new normal in African agricultural research for development space. She talked about the International Research Consortium, but the most important element of this is the power of science, the generation of science and the deployment of science in the fight against the nuances of climate change on the continent. Uh, this COP is, a, is particularly crucial for Africa and in many respects to the science, technology, and innovation strategy for Africa, the Agenda 2063, Malabo Declaration, the SDGs, and many other benchmark uh, initiatives that um, we use to express our, our race towards 
um, the SDGs. But we also understand that every little help helps. And the big question is where do we go from here? We are very grateful to the support that we've received from the European Union and all the other partners that has helped us to come this far and in establishing a long-term partnership between Europe and Africa. So today we are looking better and stronger in our collective response against the issues of climate change in agriculture. And thanks to the partnership that has evolved over the last four or five years, there is really nothing we can compare to this very crucial element in our work together, the power of partnership in strengthening the resilience of the most vulnerable people in making Africa food secure. And it's time to actually as we say, it's time for us to break the jinx. Um, coming off with the issue of the consortium and going forward, what is FARA, the institution that I'm working for, what are we bringing to the COP or taking away from the COP? It is for us to also put now on the table the framework with which we can better work together, better achieve our targets together, set goals for ourselves, and to see how we kind of recalibrate our steps over the next decade, and to see how the new body, the International Research Consortium, can contribute into the sustainable development of agriculture on our continent. Climate smart agriculture will become the new normal. And we have to really come up with ways and modalities of bringing the technologies that are requisite for growth, bringing all the technologies to those who need it the most, especially in the context of the green transition and the partnership with Africa. We will be depending on the goodwill of our friends, friends of the continent um, from Europe in this partnership and to see what lessons can we learn? Um, and what are the, the, the best practices that can be deployed to show up resilience on the African continent? And hopefully over time, we'll be able to see that the seed that is being sown in strengthening the concept of a green transition in Europe and in Africa. And of course, what does Africa have to put on the table to strengthen the partnership? It's a two-way traffic. And we do hope that both the European and the African side will become the better with this um, cooperation, especially within the context of the International Research Consortium. I will be happy to take a little bit more time when time arrives, but let me stop um, at this point for now. Back to you, Dora. Thank you very much. Very, very much, Dr. Yemi. It was perfect, a perfect introduction, and you really have put us on, on the path. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to now introduce Dr. Irene. Dr. Iren is the coordinator of our uh, LEAP for FNSSA project. Oop. Um. Next slide, please. Bianca, could you bring us Dr. Iren? So maybe I should continue. Ah, there she is. So Dr. Irene Anor Frempong is the coordinator of the LEAP for FNSSA project, which is giving birth to the IRC platform, the International Research Consortium platform. And she um, 
knows Farah very well because she has been the immediate past director of research and innovation at Farah where she coordinated many continent-wide research and capacity development projects, including the S3A, the Science Agenda for Agri Agriculture in Africa Initiative. Irene is currently a member of the Foresight for Food Steering Group and served as a commissioner of the CGIAR Commission on Sustainable Agriculture Inten Intensification co sai between 2020 and 2021. But before joining FARA in 2008, she worked for over 20 years in universities and research institutes in many countries in Africa and Europe, Nigeria, Lesotho, United Kingdom, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and in Ghana, where she served as the head of the Department of Animal Science at the University of Cape Coast. Irene has played significant roles in advancing the AU-EU Research and Innovation Partnership through the Platform for Africa-Europe Partnership on Agricultural Research for Development, BIPAD, the Leap for FNSSA, the DESIRA Pillar 2 CADP uh, projects, and the AU-EU High-Level Policy Dialogue HLPD Working Group on FNSSC. She served on the steering group of the World Bank Africa Centers of Excellence, the ACE program, and the consultative advisory group on partnership for skills in applied science, engineering, and technology, among others. Irene holds a PhD from the Veterinary School University of Bristol in the United Kingdom and a Master of Science in Animal Production from Wageningen University and research. Dr. Irene, the floor is yours. I think there is something going Thank on. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Thank you for those kind words, uh, kind introduction. And um, if I can have my slides, I would like to begin the presentation. Okay, so I think, thank you for this introduction, um, Dora. You've introduced the topic, so I'll just go to the next slide. Now, I would like to focus really um, on two things. How the International Research Consortium uh, could address challenges of climate smart agriculture in order to stem fragmentation. And secondly, how the International Research Consortium would integrate regional structures by enabling the linkages between communities of interest and region-specific needs. At the end of the day, uh, providing uh, solutions uh, for CSA. Next slide. By way of introduction, let me reiterate that the International Research Consortium was launched um, in Accra in September as part of the final General Assembly of the Horizon 2020 project called Long-Term Europe-Africa Partnership for Food and Nutrition Security and Sustainable Agriculture, LEAP for FNSSA project. By launching this International Research Consortium, we have initiated a transition from a partnership of the FNSSA to a long-term sustainable platform to improve the implementation of the FNSSA roadmap. Let me add that the FNSSA um, theme is the first priority that was put forward by the high-level policy dialogue which is the main policy process shepherding the cooperation between Africa and Europe in relation to research and innovation. So the IRC um, is being put forward as an alliance of research and innovation stakeholders that will have access to a long-term and sustainable governance as well as funding mechanism 
and of course, access to a knowledge management and communication system. So the IRC could be looked at as the main sustainable platform for the AU and EU research and innovation coordination that is expected to link all priorities, not just the FNSSA, but it will begin to link the FNSSA with the new priorities that the HLPD is putting forward, including the CCSC, that's the Climate Change and Sustainable Energy, as well as the Science, Technology, and Innovation priorities. Next slide. I would like to mention that with the launch of the IRC, we have invariably launched three success factors that assures operationalization of the International Research Consortium. First is the launch of a document that describes the structures of the IRC and provides guidelines for its establishment. Second is that we have a large uh, number of institutions research and innovation expressing interest. We currently have 43 institutions that have become signatories to the declaration of joining the International Research Consortium coming from 26 countries, 13 African and 13 European. The third implied success factor is that we have launched a set of tangible deliverables, particularly on knowledge management and a large project database that brings together over 400 FNSSA projects between Africa and Europe, a D group that is underpinning the advancements of the communication engagement, and of course, a vibrant uh, website. So there are tangibles that have been launched alongside the document and of course the, the platform of 40, 43 signatories at the moment. Next slide. So a little bit about the IRC. Now the IRC is put forward in terms of in terms of its value proposition. It is the AU EU bicontinental platform and that's important but it's also being put forward as a network of networks that is linking, linking all actors in research and innovation in Africa and Europe, European member states in order to advance the science-led growth that Dr. Yen spoke about and ensure that we underpin a sustainable FNSSA based on equity, based on common priorities uh, between the two continents and ensuring that we're able to scale um, and impact with global spillovers if indeed we need to speak to the SDGs, as mentioned earlier. So simply put, the International Research Consortium is put forward to address one major problem, which is the, the perennial problem of fragmentation of efforts, of actors, of initiatives, of funding, across the many, many research and innovation um, institutions that are advancing um, work on FNSSA. And to do that, the IRC actually postulates that it's going to improve, uh, put forward and improve the coordination infrastructure, as well as provide a knowledge management uh, mechanism and framework as well as dialogues on FNSSA. So that's, these are the two main entry points that the IRC is tackling the issue of fragmentation. Members are across the RNI continuum, including researchers, academia, funders, women and youth groups, policymakers, startups, private sector, user organizations and farmers um, are all um, part of the research, International Research Consortium. So long as they are legal entities, they, it's open to all of them to join. Now, what is interesting about this um, consortium as a network of networks, it put forward a very simple uh, coordination and governance uh, structure around four functions, 
a strategic function that is at the, the head of the governance, um, an advisory function that will be based on members, based on their own um, caliber and pedigree, an operational function, which is the main base for the actions that will be taken within the IRC, and of course, a support function that's uh, going to make the linkages between the different governance structures. It is also um, important to mention that the governance or the, the coordination of the IRC is expected to be one of rotating. Um, at any particular time, there will be two um, institutions, one from Africa and Europe, but after a period, um, this will then rotate to another set. So this is the structure that is put forward and that's what makes it exciting that we're able to talk about CSA. Next slide. Again, to quickly uh, capture and the, the functions of the IRC, I had articulated the point that the FNSSA is the bedrock for the IRC, but the IRC seeks to align with the CCSC and the STI, particularly the innovation agenda as policies and strategies under the AU EU HLPD. Five functions have been put forward for the IRC. First, to increase synergies and coherence between the actors I've mentioned. And second, to have um, access to a learning environment, including providing access to a knowledge base, um, as well as monitoring, evaluation and learning and capacity building. Thirdly, to strengthen capacities across uh, Africa and Europe, provide a sustainable and inclusive governance structure and last but not the least, ensure that uh, science is continuously interfacing with policy in order to ensure that we are addressing the important needs of both continents, Africa and Europe. Next slide. So the question now is, with this structure, how do we pursue addressing issues of climate smart agriculture? If we look at the, the, the operational arm, we have simply put there that they will be working groups. Now that's where uh, the game becomes interesting. These working groups will represent a number of um, aspects, clusters, the thematic areas, interests of local, national, regional levels. So if you look on the right-hand side, a configuration of the IRC um, looks like this. At the inner core, you will see networks from Africa, networks from Europe that, is that are coming together to form this network of networks we talk about. But then they will have to link up with important um, networks, funders networks, private sector, youth, economic communities, women entities, global research entities. Now, all these members are already signatories to the IRC. Now, if you look on the, the outermost uh, circle, I think this is where the action would really um, occur. At the national level, having focal institutions that will continue to federate the membership, but also to work in different uh, facets, be it clusters, be it thematic areas, be it interests um, at different levels, they will work and converge at the center through the networks that then will link up with the strategic function in terms of governance, and that will inform the HLPD in terms of policy. So for instance, if we take climate smart agriculture, the IRC is going to provide all its members with access to a, a huge database of projects. And you, when you search it, it is such a robust database that gives you information immediately about the type of um, data or the type of projects that are being done under climate smart agriculture, the type of funder, the location, the type of organization, it brings you immediately all this information. As we track now, we had over 400 
or so within the theme of FNSSA alone on climate smart agriculture. Now, given that the current COP27 is now focusing on um, climate um, in terms of um, adaptation, moving a little bit from mitigation, but adaptation and resilience, once you have access to such a, a knowledge uh, base, we then will do the tracking, which I talked about, the um, monitoring, evaluation, and learning that will help us now to see the outcomes of all these uh, climate-related uh, programs and be able to articulate where capacity development is required, where partnerships are required, where prioritization will be important, and then putting forward policy briefs and policy engagements that will, of course, inform policy and inform investment targeting. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, we, we now sit at the brink of a game changer, something that's going to help us um, in this F, um, era of the new normal, as the EV said, how we will advance very quickly and swiftly coordination of all these many, many fragmented projects, but articulating them and ratcheting them up to a point where we can provide substantial policy direction and investment direction to improve the targets that we've set ourselves at different levels, including the SDG. Last slide, please. So let me conclude by making these few points that the International Research Consortium is currently engaging in a transition phase between its launch and the time it will be set up um, somewhere at the end of 2023. It is enlarging its member base, strengthening institutional commitments, particularly member states, and working towards ensuring the linkages between the different priorities of the HLPD. And at the end of the day, recognizing that we have to have a collective action in terms of climate smart agriculture. And so the IRC really is that game changer that will ensure the green transitions in terms of the African food and European food systems. And so far as we're looking at food nutrition, uh, security and sustainable agriculture. So I would like to end um, my short presentation on the IRC and what it offers for advancing climate smart agriculture. Last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Riren. That was crystal clear and uh, summarizing really all the challenges and all what we need to achieve. Now we are bringing to the table another angle of uh, the African European uh, dimension, and that is the private sector. Dr. Sharif El Gabali is with us. And Dr. Sharif has this particularity of uh, having both a socio-political uh, role and uh, activities together with being a major businessman in the agribusiness sector. So Dr. Sharif El Gabali is presently the head of the External Relations Committee in the African Parliament, but he's also the head of the Africa Committee at uh, our House of Parliament in Egypt, as well as being the, the chair of the Africa Committee in the Federation of Egyptian Industries. And uh, in what concerns his uh, private agribusiness uh, activities, he is the chair of Polyserve Group. And that is a large conglomerate based in Egypt and involved in the production of fertilizers, trading, agriculture and logistics. Uh, Dr. Sharif uh, graduated from the Faculty of Engineering, Cairo University, majoring in chemical engineering and got his PhD from SOFIA, Higher Institute of Chemical Technology. And um, from the seventh, uh, in the seventies, he was a research engineer at the Arab League and then uh, held the position of general manager for Northeast Africa with Dow Chemical. Uh, in the same time, Dr. Sharif uh, has organized and continues to organize a no an impressive number of bilateral and multilateral cooperation, 
between international organizations and business associations. He is also the chairman of the Egyptian Exporters Association of the Federation of Egyptian Chamber of Commerce, the chairman of the um, Egypt, a number of Asian business councils, Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, China, Spain, and uh, last but not least, he's the member of the board of our Egyptian Businessmen Association, the leading entity representing the uh, private sector in Egypt. And Dr. Sharif is going to give us the dimension of the Africa regional and continental trade structures and the linkages to support CSA and FNSSA. Dr. Sharif, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Dorn. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for, for receiving me. Well, I will try to give some of the main highlights on this issue of uh, agriculture and relation with it. what can Europe do to Africa in research, in terms of research and so on. Because as you know, uh, let's take some facts, main facts. Uh, Africa, uh, you, uh, Africa has about 930 million hectares of land uh, that is, that is uh, su suitable for agriculture. I mean, 930 million hectares. That's a big amount of land. Only 50% uh, maybe is used presently, okay? So uh, that's, that's, of course, something that should be dealt with. And of course, here research comes as a very important tool. Uh, there are about 224 million Africans who, who suffer malnutrition, of course, today. And of course, uh, uh, of the population of 1.4 billion in Africa today. And if we look at the inter-Africa trade today between the African countries, it does not exceed even 15%. So we have a lot of problems in Africa. Comes now climate change. And the problem is that climate change is affecting the, Afri the African agriculture very seriously. And uh, although Africa, as we know, only has uh, three to four percent of the emissions today uh, in the world, which is a very a meager number. Yet, nevertheless, it's very much affected with the climate change that comes from other parts of the world. And it's affecting very seriously agriculture. That's why we have famine, we have droughts, we have, uh, 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 I mean, flooding. We have all kinds of serious environmental changes that happen. Uh, Hence, we need to deal very seriously with this issue today. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the important issues to deal with is to bring Africa as a strong agriculture continent, which it is actually ready and geared to, do, to, to, to be. As I said, 900 something, 20 million hectares, only half per, per, uh, being used. The rest is very much neglected, no irrigation system, no well-developed irrigation system, no fertilization system, very under-fertilized in many countries. Uh, this pest control system also is very weak in many countries. Um, there is no real... Uh, uh, Africa is not ready to deal with climate changes in the way that it should be. For example, uh, we in Egypt, we are trying to work very hard on this issue today with, uh, as Minister of Agriculture and so on. Uh, for example, we tried to develop early warning system for, for the weather, for example. Uh, we are uh, trying to, uh, 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 to, so that, to inform farmers in advance how to deal with uh, any weather uh, climate changes. We're developing with new speeches of, uh, of seeds and uh, other things that could resist climate changes today. Uh, we are changing the, in, in any, in any, for example, the agricultural season, we can change it today depending on the weather, climate changes that are affecting. Uh, we are also working more uh, seriously on integrated pest, pest management. Um, so uh, all these, uh, we try, so we're trying to work on the irrigation systems, of course, we're working on it in Egypt very seriously by, by, by working on the canals and uh, 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 improving the kind of system we have in Egypt for, for irrigation and so on. So Egypt has quite a good experience that is started to deal with this weather changes, but this needs to be 
transferred to Africa. And here comes the, the, the role of the European Union and, and comes the role of International Research Consortium. This research consortium should work very closely with countries like Egypt, which are kind of more developed. And, uh, and South Africa, for example, also is very well developed also in agriculture, especially smart agriculture and so on. This is another part also we should, cut, we should touch base on. So here we should work together with, with the Euro Europeans to develop all these techniques to deal with the weather change in Africa and to make Africa self-sufficient, not only self-sufficient, as the main agriculture basket of the world. Africa can be very, there are only two places in the world where agriculture can develop very seriously because it has the land and the water resources. That is Africa and Brazil. These are the two main regions in the world where you still have a lot of room to expand in terms of agriculture, okay? So now we're talking Africa, so let's work Africa. Where is, where is very important comes the research. Research is very important. Research is, is the only way to help Africa to get out of its misery, of, of its agricultural misery uh, that I have witnessed in many countries. It's very sad that we have such big potential and unused in the right way in many, many of the African countries I've visited also. So uh, we should work together, uh, uh, European Union, organizations like the African Union, of course, is very important, with the, with the Commission responsible for environment, Commission responsible for agriculture, uh, that should to, 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 to be able to work together on, on a professional basis, because African Union has the data and can and is present everywhere in, in Africa. At the same times we have, as, as uh, Ms. Dora said, I'm, I'm a member of the African Parliament and I handle the International Relations Committee and the conflict resolution in Africa, okay? This, this organization, Pan-African Parliament, like African Union and so on, can be a very important vehicle for the cooperation with the European side, but it's not existing today. It's not existing. Okay, it's existing in some issues political, like, like democratization, uh, uh, statelessness, you know, these issues are Europe is helping yeah, here and there, but going to agriculture, going to really where, how you can spot, you, you stop immigrant, immigrants from going. When the country is developed, when they have jobs, when they have enough food, they will not immigrate, okay? So it is, it is a very important role for Europe to play today. And the research is, is the vital, pivot, pivotal point on which we should depend. So please, let's work together through a common committee between our side in Africa, whether the African Union or the Pan-African Parliament was Egypt's uh, uh, business organization or whatever, South African organizations, and work together and put a, uh, put a master plan on how we can improve the present, uh, to improve this dire situation in Africa today. I don't need to explain more, it's well known, but what is not known is that there is no action plan really on the ground. Uh, research can do research, but not really related to what's going on in Africa itself. Thank you, Ms. Dora. Thank you very, 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 very much, Dr. Sharif. That was really perfect. And uh, I think it added uh, very substantially to the roadmap we need to, uh, to, to get into. Uh, we don't... We unfortunately are running out of time. Uh, so I will, if you allow me, uh, go immediately into the presentation of uh, Dr. Madalena, uh, sorry, Mrs. Madalena Gatinchka, and um, who is going to give us the European side of the story, so to speak. Uh, Mrs. Gajinska is the research policy officer at the European Commission in the DG Research and Innovation. And she is following our activities since several years, being the co-chair of the FNSSA working group. Her fields of expertise are agricultural development, emergencies and resilience, fisheries and aquaculture, food safety, food security, food systems, livestock policies, strategies, and guidelines. Allow me, Madalena, not to uh, develop more in order to give you all the time needed for you to do your presentation. 
Please, to you, Madalena. Thank you so much, Dora. Could I please ask for my slides? Thank you for invitation to speak at this very important event. I would like to speak about the farm to fork strategy being at the heart of the climate change mitigation and action programs. If I could, yes, great. But let me start from asking you one question. Which do you believe is the most important? To produce enough nutritious, affordable food for every person or to protect the future of our planet? We believe, we don't believe we should have to choose actually. As the European Green Deal sets out to make Europe the world's first climate neutral continent, farm to fork is at its heart, investing billions of euros into research and technologies, transforming how we produce, distribute and consume our food for healthy people, healthy society and the healthy planet. And at the same time, creating new opportunities for consumers, farmers and the food industry. It's time to reshape tomorrow, to move from an idea to a reality and from a farm to fork. And do you have appetite for a change? Next slide, please. Um, I believe, yes, I believe you have the appetite. And that's why uh, in the farm to fork strategy that was launched in May 2020, the key elements of the European Green Deal uh, are mentioned. So the farm to fork strategy mentions four general goals, and these are to reduce the environmental and climate footprint of the EU food system, to strengthen its resilience, to ensure food security, to lead the global transition towards competitive sustainability for farm to fork, and to tap into new opportunities. It presents sustainability as a growth strategy that is what our citizens increasingly demand, nutritious food, which is healthy and is produced in a way which is respectful towards our planet. Next slide, please. The the farm to fork strategy is an opportunity to improve lifestyles, health and the environment and ensure fair economic returns and livelihoods for operators and farmers and fishers. A sustainable food system should be sustainable in all three dimensions, the economic, environmental and social. And that leads me to the food 2030 concept. Next slide, please. The Food 2030 concept is referred to in the Farm to Fork strategy. It is a policy framework to future proof our nutrition and food systems through research and innovation. It proceeds the Farm to Fork strategy as it has started in 2016 and fed the research dimension to help develop the Farm to Fork strategy. We have identified a number of priorities that the Food 2030 is keen to tackle. And the first one of these is nutrition for sustainable and healthy diets. That's everything uh, that relates to keeping people healthy and food safety is also embedded in there. The second relates to transforming food systems to have, um, so they become climate smart and environmentally sustainable for the whole system. And by climate smart, we mean not just in terms of climate mitigation, but also in the terms of climate adaptation. The third priority relates to circularity and resource efficiency throughout the whole food system. And the fourth is about innovation to empower communities. And by communities, we mean cities, towns, and rural areas. Please make a click. Thank you. And to achieve those food 2030 priorities, we need to apply system thinking and deliver co-benefits to nutrition climate, circularity, and innovation. And I wanted to point out in here the importance of climate in achieving those uh, priorities. Next slide, please. Um, in the Food 2030 concept, we have a 10 pathways for action that will guide you through the future Horizon Europe calls as well, uh, that uh, as well as represent the key levers of change where research and innovation can have a deep and multiple impact in realizing the, the food system vision I just described. And those path pathways are represented on this tree in dark green. And the outer layer of the tree uh, lists the relevant parts of the Horizon Europe Though the inner layer, the four foot 2030 priorities I have just mentioned, the entire, uh, the entire tree is driven by the EU policies and the nutrients, and the sun on the top right, the European Green Deal, is allowing the photosynthesis, photosynthesis and ensuring synergies with the climate ambitions. Next slide, please. And talking about Horizon Europe, I would like to strongly encourage you to participate in the Horizon Europe Info Days and the matchmaking brokerage event that is taking place in mid-December, and specifically for the Cluster 6 Info Days on food, bioeconomy, natural resources, agriculture and environment. 
the info days are taking place on 13th and 14th of December, and the brokerage matchmaking event on the sixth on the 19th of December. I will post the link in the chat uh, just after my speech. And the next slide, please. And the last but not the least, I would like to as well take this opportunity to kindly encourage you to participate online or in person in a stakeholder event on the African Union European Union Innovation Agenda, 23rd, 24th November in Nairobi. And I will send the link uh, to this event as well in the chat. Thank you so much. Back to Dora. Thank you so much, Madalena. And uh, we really need to uh, do, as you said, to continue use the existing tools, as you mentioned, for Rise in Europe, for sure, and uh, as well to address the um, challenges outlined by uh, Dr. Hiren and by Dr. Sharif, both being extremely important. The good news is that we have 10 minutes more because we started late, so we will be able to have Isabel, probably not the Q&A, unfortunately. In any case, uh, the, Dr. Daniele Rossi, I think we haven't managed to connect him, uh, but it's certainly going to be for the for next, uh, next session. Uh, I would like, without further ado, to present uh, Isabel, my friend Isabel, uh, if you can please bring her on screen. Uh, Isabelle Hippolyte is uh, within the uh, Agence Nationale de Recherche in France, the French National Funding Agency. She's in charge of the scientific uh, activities, including agriculture and food systems. And uh, she has been uh, primarily involved in developing funders' uh, participation schemes at international level as scientific officer for ANR for the self-sustained ERANET, ERA uh, CAPS, the ERANET co-fund co forest value, the ICTA agri-food and SUS crop, and she's the deputy coordinator of the ERANET co-fund LEAP Agri and I believe that she wishes to uh, present to us the outcome of the uh, recent Leap Agri uh, work as well. Isabel, the floor is yours. Isabel, mic, please. Well, Isabel, on vous entend pas. The button. It's okay now? Yes. 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 Well, what what I just wanted to say, if uh, is that when we are um, earning all of you, there is something which is important. Is that I think that for for the FNSSC topics, it is likely the first time that Europe and uh, and Africa, even they are different goals, they are they have converging goals. The one is to be sustainable, to be more resilient. And in terms of scaling, I likely Europe needs to downscale a little. It's a very extensive agriculture, while Africa needs still to up, um, to, to have a more, a more extensive agriculture being in the same time, very sustainable. It's why, in terms of research and innovation, the calendars and uh, and uh, and the strategic agenda should be 
not easily, but will this this converging view should should um, should facilitate the, the 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 converging research and innovation. Then um, just to, to be back to the the international research uh, consortium, uh, of course, Irene explain us how will be the general frame and it, it is really clear for everybody i guess and i will be back i would be back on the working groups and on the, the operational uh, units of the irc what we propose at this at this point is that as you said uh, and as i said likely programmation as uh, research and innovation programmation has to evolve and in this in this goal the funders communities have a central role to play both funders from the private sectors but and funders from the public sectors where i come from then as you said fnssa face new challenges in relation with global change but also uh, increase in population we saw also and all the all the reports mentioned that there is very it's very difficult and it took it take a lot of time to transform research results into innovation and extra approval, likely because the, the, the final actors or the practitioners are not involved in all the process in the, since the beginning. And if the challenge are global, there are some regional or sub-regional specificities that hampers to have at the beginning or at the, at the, the beginning of the process a general discussion and uh, that that should lead to something um, uh, strong, uh, strong for everybody then a multi a multi actors approach must be implemented and should be followed of course and uh, automated systematized should i have the next slide please thank you then, of course, as funder, we support the development of the ERC as it was presented by Irene. And we propose that the, the, the funders, privates and public funders intervene in two kinds of bodies or structure, which are the, something for the programming and strategic agenda, which are perennial and regional. Uh, working groups and when all the activities have been defined and uh, refined and proposed by the governance then the implementation is also a lead by these uh, funders and private third funders depending of their interest in the initiative should i have the next slide thank you then if we we speak about the first group uh irene Iran also um, already indicated all the kind of stakeholders that should be uh, involved in the ERC and in its functioning. I will just give some 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 example there from a coordination in the, each regional each regional uh, working groups. There there are invited people for discussing. Um, already defined topics by the governance in order to see if they are in adequacy with the uh, national and regional uh, policies and strategic agenda, which is the type of instrument that should be implemented at the best for reaching the goals that are defined by the governance and, uh, and, uh, and all, all initiatives that should be taken on these topics that are defined a college, uh, in the collegial manner by the governance. When each group has defined its priority, therefore the, the, leading, the, leading group, the leaders of the group rediscuss them and then bring to the governance some um, ranked uh, instruments and topics and then the governance defined with them which kind of initiative should be launched and then it is the next diapositive the next slide then temporary funders networks uh, are uh, build build and uh, implement the action proposed by the governance on a voluntary basis and of course of, of their own interest 
Then the perennial regional working groups build the proposal on the basis of multi-stakeholders and regional priorities and uh, following governance proposal. They are more or less similar to what we know at the European level, which are the, the joint program initiative, like the GPI FATCHE, GPI Ocean, while the temporary networks are similar to the temporary consortium of ERANET or ERANET Co-Fund Knowledge Hub, uh, which are implemented in the EC initiative. There are independency with the two mechanisms in this in this kind of schemes, defining the action versus implementing the actions, and this avoid the conflicts of interest. In this frame, we discussed last week, and uh, Irene and uh, Dora and also Magdalena were participating to the final meeting of Lipagri. Lipagri is. Uh, is uh, was enfin, is because it's not really finished yet is uh, an eranet co-fund which uh, funded 27 research and innovation project between european participants and african participants and in this frame we presented the result last week and we also discussed which should be the, the best way for these uh, stakeholders, I mean researchers and, uh, and agriculture, to participate to, to the ERC. And they gave some, some, some guidelines and some recommendations that already that I had that I already shared with Irene. Therefore, just as a brief conclusion, I would di I would say that for funders participating to the ERC is really interesting in in different ways, the, I will take my... Is, uh, Isabelle, if, uh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> just... We yes. need to conclude, sorry. <laughs> yes, then, therefore, we are very interesting to participate due to the ERC in working groups with uh, multi-actors, uh, with multi-actors participation for defining the action that will be launched or proposed by the ERC. Thanks so much and sorry for, for being long. Thank you. I, I one last sentence to close the session. It was great. We will need with the, to organize the same thing again to be able to develop. And I would like to take up uh, what Dr. Sharif has suggested to work out programs. And we, as members of Leap for FNSSA, are ready to work on this without waiting for 2023 to work on what can be already put in place. Uh, in terms of cooperation. Thank you very much to all of you and goodbye from Shamishi. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.